Martin Heim uh, to lead the discussion. He will introduce himself later, but I would like to introduce the former president of the Hungarian Reform Bishops Conference, Dr. Gustav Polske. Uh, and I'm also a reformed Swiss uh, reverend. Uh, I feel very happy to meet you again. Then Rabbi Tamash Rona. Tamash, that's very good. Rabbi of the Great Lake Region of Hungary. Then Mr. Sultan Shulok, President of the Organization of Hungarian Muslims. Then the member of Societas Jesuit, Jesuit monk, Mr. Ulrich Kish, <laughs> and from our host is Mero Matias, yeah, Nava Pastor, and I would like to give the floor to Bishop Martin Heim. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. I welcome you to this uh, panel discussion. Uh, my first impression, I say very frankly, is today, this morning, religion seems to be male. There's no, unfortunately, no female participant. It is the opposite impression as we had yesterday evening. <laughs> But let us start, we are, as we are, in this discussion, we are the guests in Hungary and we are, all of us, are interested how is the interface situation in this country with a long, long tradition and uh, we have uh, make uh, the, uh, your information that Every one of the speakers will have around about five minutes to introduce his own insight into the situation of interface dialogue in Hungary. Then we are discussing amongst us, raising questions or everything. And then the floor will be opened to you. And uh, I am expecting a vibrant discussion. So, let me start to introduce myself. My name is Martin Hein. I'm a Protestant bishop in Germany. On this commemorative day, I know what it means to be German. I'm serving since 18 years in my diocese and uh, I'm engaged in the ECRL, European Council of Religious Leaders, since 2010. And now I would like to hand over the mic to our first guest, to Tomasz, from the Jewish point of view. Uh, thank you very much. It's a great honor to be here. And uh, before a uh, few minutes, uh, you, you, you asked me that uh, how many minutes I, I need, and I, I, I said five. And what kind of minutes you asked? I said Jewish minutes, because maybe it will be a little bit longer, but I will have. So, uh, Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I have a, I've been serving as a rabbi in the Jewish communities of the Great Plain for 20 years. I met the values of the Christian Jewish dialogue during my university studies and lectures. The values have fortunately within over the past few decades. There are two organizations in Hungary that have been brought to life for the permanent and meaningful existence of Christian and Jewish dialogue. One of them is the Christian Jewish Society. As the member of this society, have been visiting the smaller and the larger settlements of Hungary together with eclectic dignitaries and secular scientists. We present common lectures, we address basic concepts, and we try to keep the idea of the famous Hungarian poet, Bobby Mihai, alive constantly. There is a song in the soul of weak and strong, and we hear our own soul in every song. 
and who has a beautiful song in the soul that hears the song of others beautiful. The Society works with presentation, publication and resolution for almost three decades now. The other organization is the Christian Jewish Council, which is the member organization of the International Council of uh, Christian and Jews. This council in Hungary was founded by President uh, Arpad Götz. And the membership of the organization came from the chief priests of Christian and Jewish churches. The most important volume of intellectual circle or lodge that this has created an opportunity to establish a permanent dialogue between the highest levels of the aforementioned churches so they can formulate common thoughtful and powerful messages on fundamental issues. Both the society and the International Council have a special organization in the field of Islamic, Christian and Jewish dialogue. In Hungary, we are in close contact with the dialogue platform, which is a board created by the Muslim community in Turkey, and with which we collaborate in order to complain, join, uh, organize conferences and presentations. In recent years, we have created close cooperation with Boktaveda College. As well, uh, we have been presenting lectures together with my rabbinical colleagues and uh, with the leading professor uh, professors of the institution on giving topics like uh, body and soul, life and passing, dietary rules, or tree of life, etc. A decade old tradition is that organize a prayer day in January and in summer in which we pray together for each other. Three years ago, the World Conference of International Council of Christian and Jews was held in Rome. I was honored that I could attend the occasion and the conference was received by Pope Francis. This organization assumes a uh, deceived role today at the level of international dialogue. It tries to give message, messages to the challenges of the current era through religious and academic responses. The Nostra Etate or the Blue Emmet are good examples for these kind of messages. In um, 2015, Hungary applied for organizing the annual World Conference of the International Council of Christian and Jews. For the first time in the history of this event, the result was published in February 2016 in Happenheim, where the Martin Buber House and the headquarters of the, of the organization are located. After a long, tenuous work, thank for the creator of the world, nearly 300 deceived personalities from 70 countries will arrive in Hungary to spend four days here between 24 till 27 June, according to the principle of the human spiritual building. Finally, I would like to end my speech with the story of Isaac Baba Bitzinger, uh, which brings us into a tiny Polish shtetl, where one of the Bird winers loses his job and his livelihood, and he visits the rabbi to ask for his help. Rabbi, I have seven children. A rich, a rich person. I have hungry mouses to feed, dress and teach. Please give me work and help me. After a short consideration, the rabbi answers, My dear son, take your chair every morning at seven o'clock, sit on the third hill from the village and stay there until the sunset. If you see the Mashiach approach, just run to me immediately and I can give you three kopeikas a week for this job. <laughs> they shake each other's hands and the next day these beloved start working as a Mashiach observer and a messenger. One week passes away, then the second and then the third and one morning, our man steps to the rabbi after the prayers and says, Rabbi, I have two problems. The first one uh, is that here, that's just a little money. Yes, my son, the rabbi answers. It may be scarce, but you can make a living out of it. And what is your other problem? What is the other compliment, my son? The job is really very, very boring. <laughs> Upon hearing these words, the, the rabbi pulls up, hugs him, kisses his forehead, looks deep into his eyes, raises his right hand and points with his index finger. But the job 
is eternal. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. And uh, we do not ask to the rabbi, but we are listening now the other partners of the panel, and I uh, hand over to Bishop. <coughs> Thank you very much, dear ladies and gentlemen. I'm very pleased to uh, to be here and take part in this discussion. Uh, when I was born in a little village in the eastern part of Hungary, I, I was sure that all people in Hungary are reformed. And it was a reformed village. Except my grandmother, she was Roman Catholic. Mm -hmm. uh, last year, I visited a small congregation in the eastern part of Hungary and uh, met a lady. She was the major of, of this village. And uh, of course, uh, since the time I have grandchildren, I, I talk uh, even very, very often my grandchildren, and she uh, she did the same, and uh, she told me, oh, I'm sorry, my grandchildren are very, very far in Indonesia, and my son has a job by an international company, and his wife is a, uh, a young lady from Taiwan, and two beautiful Hungarian Taiwanese children. <coughs> I'm sure that this, uh, this small example are, are very typical for the radical change in the last 50 years. Uh, if we, we spoke about the religious field in Hungary, 50 years ago, there are the, the traditional so-called historical Christian churches, the Jewish community, and that's it. And today, uh, it is really, uh, first of all, in, in Budapest and in the greater cities, uh, very multi cultural and multi-religional uh, field. How is possible cooperation between religion, confession, and so on and so on? It is the main issue, I mean, for this conference. Uh, I mean, and this is perhaps a short remark, that uh, today we heard about it very important and uh, very crucial historical day in the European history. But in the Hungarian history today uh, had, has uh, other importance and, and uh, today is the, the first session of the new elected parliament we heard. But I mean it is one of the reasons why uh, the so-called historical Christian churches, not so high represented, sorry, not uh, a church, uh, bishops, cardinals, and so on and so on, they are sitting now in, in Parliament. This is a, a remark and a sign, but is important for the churches in Hungary today. It is uh, very important to be present in the session of the parliament, and not so important to be here. Uh, cooperation <coughs> and dialogue. Uh, I mean, there are one side very theoretical issues, but on the other hand, uh, there are they are very very practical issues. When we have practical cooperation and, and practical dialogue, not just dialogue about dialogue and so on and so on, then uh, it is a very important contribution uh, for our contemporary uh, 
time, then I'm sure the people today in Hungary, in Europe, and perhaps everywhere in the world, the first question uh, is not, are you a Reformed, are you a Jewish, are you a uh, Hare Krishna, and so on and so on. <coughs> Are you a believer? And then if they have a common ground and a common uh, understanding, we have more credibility for the people. They, they will know something about what for us important. Thank you, Mr. Our next speaker comes from uh, the Islamic side and uh, let us know a little bit of the history of Hungary uh, 500 years ago. The situation was quite different. I remind you on the Battle of uh, Mohac, 1526. The Turks came to Hungary as uh, Muslims. And now, I think, in the memory of uh, people, such events uh, will last a long time. How is the situation uh, today, the recent situation for Muslims in Hungary? Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. <laughs> In the name of God, the most gracious, the most merciful. Uh, thank you very much, first of all, to be here. Um, to start with history, so I was thinking about speaking a few words about history. Um, the Islamic history in Hungary even dates back before the, the Turkish rule, because the history of Islam in Hungary more than 1,000 years old. It dates back even before the Arbat dynasty, when the, Hung when the Hungarians uh, settled down in the Carpathian basins, uh, the Muslims were with them. So there were some uh, Muslim <coughs> elements with the Hungarians. But during the storms of the history, the Islamic presence was three times abolished completely from this land. And it reappeared for the fourth time during the, the last years of, of communism. And uh, the organized Islamic activity started in the late 80s, just right before the transition. The very first Islamic organization, the Muslim Students Association, was set up in the year of uh, 87. And uh, the religious dialogue started at that time from our side. Um, because for dialogue, there is direct instructions in the teachings of Islam. So we have to come together, become we have to come to the common word uh, with the people of the book, first of all, but with representatives of other religions as well, because our duty as humans is to improve the earth, spread the goodness to, to anyone. And because of this, so we have to come together with our fellow human beings. The organization of Muslims in Hungary, which I'm, I'm the president for the moment, was set up in the year of 2000, so quite late. Um, and I'm the president of this organization since uh, 2001, so since 17 years now. Um, but since the very beginning, this organization is involved in the interreligious dialogue um, with, with all uh, denominations, with all uh, uh, religious groups. And um, <coughs> as far as I remember, if I remember correctly, around 2005 and 6, there was a forum for cooperation of world religions, and it was the, the Krishna movement, uh, some Buddhist uh, uh, organizations, the Unitarian Christians, the, the Sim Shalom progressive Jewish movement, and we Muslims were participating. And when the, the amendment of the church law came in 2011 and 12, and the number of religious organizations was considerably limited from 300 something into 32, uh, we, re we uh, made another uh, 
Forum for Cooperation, we called it um, Council of Registered Eastern Religions. And we have the, the Krishna movement, we have the Buddhist uh, organizations, and we Muslims are participating. We are meeting uh, every uh, month. And we try to organize even common programs. And we were participating uh, in cultural uh, events, uh, giving information uh, to the people interested in uh, these religions. And also uh, with the Krishna movement, because they, they took the, the, the leading role, uh, we participated in, in charity, uh, giving food to the deprived people of Budapest. Because as we think, the, the, the dialogue should yield something good in practice. Because doing dialogue for the dialogue is not satisfactory, it's not enough. We have to build the trust, first of all. We have to build a common platform that anyone can work together for achieving the common good for the society without uh, violating the religious traditions. So that's our aim. And of course, this dialogue is extended to the, the Jewish and Christian uh, 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 groups and, and, and churches as well, because we regularly sit with the, the, the Christian Jewish Council, so we are participating in the meetings, and we hope that uh, we will show a good example and good practice for the general uh, public of the society. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yesterday evening we have been invited to the Hare Krishna temple in Budapest. We had an excellent reception uh, and we had some table speeches uh, to get more uh, information about how to live with an Eastern religion in a Western context. So I hand over the mic. <coughs> <coughs> Hare Krishna. Uh, my name is Madhupati Das, but before I start using my five minutes, let me welcome a late arriving uh, personality here, Professor Yozef Sechi, who is perhaps the, the person here present who has done the most for interfaith religion. Please give him a, a great applause. <laughs> So we started the, the Christian Jewish uh, uh, Christian Jewish uh, Council like 25 years ago, and he is entirely working on a dialogue in which now involves the Muslims, as was mentioned. So, so I, I I think we owe a great respect to him. So, okay. So I would like to mention one form of interfaith dialogue, which is very very successful here in this country. And as an exception, it wasn't started by the Hare Krishnas, but by a, by a, a Buddhist, uh, Rabo Geza, who is a journalist with the 24.hu uh, uh, internet magazine. And the title of this series of articles, or several articles, is uh, God Knows. You see? Sometimes you say, God knows. Of course, God knows. So uh, every week, he sends around uh, a tough question. Uh, these questions are uh, well, no, no taboos, and uh, and uh, and uh, they are based on on a, a news item of the week or some topical news item. And he sends these questions around to the five great world religions: uh, Jewish, Christian, Muslim, uh, Buddhist, and uh, Hindu religion representatives. And every week. Uh, a select uh, person, of course not always the same person in one religion, gives a response. And uh, I must say, uh, several people are sitting in this room who are regular contributors to this series. And uh, this, uh, you see, uh, I think the importance of this uh, series is that, number one, it helps us understand the other faith better. Now, what are you afraid of? You are afraid of something you don't know. Now, if you get to know other faiths, uh, you, you can develop a more better understanding, better cooperation. After all, they are also human beings. 
So this is very, very useful. The other thing is that this has evolved into something even, even more active and out, outreaching because the most regular contributors sometimes get together and visit like pop festivals, schools, cultural events, and we give uh, panels like this and we discuss steepy questions. For instance, there is the uh, festival, summer festival Everness, which is a very popular festival among New Age people and uh, transcendental, budding transcendentalists. And uh, for two years now, this, uh, this group of, uh, of people has visited this festival, but we also went to country, countryside uh, towns and presenting at uh, libraries and schools. So this is a, an excellent way of uh, presenting multi-faith approach to all generations, practically, all generations. So I think this is a very good, uh, actually a, a book has already been published for the, uh, containing the first something like 200, 200 articles. And, uh, and I must confess, this also helps me understand my faith as well, better. Because uh, these questions can roughly be uh, classified into two great categories. One are the, the moral, moral questions, and uh, the, the, there can be so many such things like euthanasia or abortion or bioethical questions. And the other is understanding what's going on, and and of course our understanding is based on the law of karma and uh, and the the faith in, uh, in reincarnation. And it is, it is very, very instructive for our own faith to see what others say to questions like this. Like, for instance, a five-year-old girl in Texas was killed by a stray bullet. Now, what's the explanation for that? Or, uh, or uh, these bioethical things that, uh, what do you think about cloning people? And, the, and the, the responses are very, very instructive. So I think my five minutes are up, so I return the mic to you. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> and last but not least, uh, insight from the Roman Catholic uh, point of view, I invite uh, Father Kish to present. Well, now hunger in Peter style, I like this. It's not easy, but uh, you are um, then obliged to speak about the essentials. Uh, you know, Hungarian are strange people because they always start with history. Um, and if you speak now about interface dialogue, uh, actually in Hungary, uh, what, what we do now, it's an exotic curiosum, but what is has substantial importance, it is the first the ecumenical movement, and which means in Hungarian context mostly dialogue between Protestant and Catholic. Second, there is, um, let's say, the lack of dialogue between uh, the Orthodox Christians and the Western style, where Catholic and Protestant, to my observation, are most closer to each other than, for instance, the Catholic and the Orthodox, despite the fact there is no theological difference. Um, and then the third level is uh, the cooperation with our Jewish friend. I don't speak about the Islam, because the Islam history was 150 years, which I wouldn't call cooperation or dialogue. But uh, when, um, after the uh, fall of the Berlin Wall, um, started a community, community of uh, Islamic uh, people, uh, they have been invited to kind of panels like this. And I myself participated at least uh, seven times as this kind of dialogue between the Jewish, the Christian, and the um, by the way, the Jewish always told jokes. That's, that's a constant <laughs> you can rely upon. Now, um, I think you have to add the two dimensions um, if in the context of Hungary. This first is the Hungarian immigration. Uh, after the revolution of 56, more than 300,000 people left Hungary. 
and uh, settled in Western Europe and the United States and elsewhere. And in 1971, we have had the first ecumenical meeting in Sion and Sitten in Switzerland, organized by the Catholic, Reformed, and Evangelical Christians. And we have it every five years. Myself organized three meetings in Western Europe. When the communism fall, uh, we moved to Hungary. And uh, the strength of this movement you don't see anymore because there are so, so many uh, movements. But for more than 20 years, uh, the cooperation between the three church, not official level like a, a national feast and so on, but in, in the depths, took place in the immigration. For instance, I remember when, for instance, Chesa Bolasso is a Hungarian, famous Hungarian writer and worker for C BBC, uh, texted together with Iyes, who is a poet, and three present uh, Protestant priests the ecumenical formula of the credo, for instance. Second uh, point, uh, which makes uh, our case a little bit strange, that uh, at least three million Hungarians who live near the border in the neighboring countries, and there the communities uh, um, have a local dialogue with the Christians uh, of other faiths, but mainly also with the Christians of the same faiths, but other nationality. There is a dimension of the dialogue <coughs> which is not easier, but sometimes harder. For instance, I come now from Mavashvasha in the middle of Transylvania, and we have no problem so far with our Protestant friends. They invite, we invite each other. We have uh, every year uh, ecumenical day and so forth, but there is virtually no dialogue with the Orthodox Church. Don't ask me why. Uh, it's just a fact, I tell you. And I think that's a pity. And sometimes, for instance, when the Hungarian plane, why the Pope didn't visit the Hungarian minority in Transylvania, one reason is that the Catholic Church uh, is engaged in the dialogue with the Orthodox Church. But at the local level, it doesn't take place. So that's, uh, that's uh, the perspective. I think uh, in the future, it's very, very important to, to find a way and the good sign is that Sam <laughs> Stephen, the founder of Christian Hungary, has been uh, um, <coughs> canonized by the Orthodox uh, Patriarch of uh, Constantinople, <coughs> saying he was king of Hungary and saint just before the separation of the Eastern and the Western Church. Um, I think that this dialogue between communi Christian communities, on the one hand, and between the Jewish and uh, uh, Christian communities is the basis on which you can base everything. Everything other is is just a joke, of, 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 of a, a play, a, how do you do, a toy uh, of intellectuals. We are all highly developed intellectuals with university diplomas. Go in the villages, nobody will have problems with, with, with Buddhism or, or Islam. Or you have to fix the local context, and the local context. Before the First World War, there were so many Hungarian communities where three nations and five uh, uh, faces <coughs> lived together peacefully. And I think um, what you have been telling in the introduction, non-believers or just believers blame us believers for all the terrible wars. Whether we like it or not, that's what people believe not just in Hungary. I remember when I entered the Society of Jesus, I wrote a letter to one famous fashion maker whom, for whom I work, and he told me, well, I admire your decision, but you know, you, Christian, this was for all the worst wars. That's what people believe. How do we convince them that this is not true? First of all, m making it untrue. That's what I think we should be all together. Thank you very much. You have uh, uh, risen the first question I want to, to uh, put on the panel. Um, what is uniting us? We are people of faith altogether. Different faith, but we are people of faith. And we heard something about uh, secularism as a movement in the Western Europe uh, and uh, 
I just wanted to know how do you experience that uh, growing secularism in Hungary? Or isn't there? <laughs> Who wants to answer on that? Rabbi. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, pastors, uh, cleric, priests, uh, we have a great possibility for uh, our congregations uh, to give knowledge and experience. To, to draw a picture and to put inside colors and that's uh, that's our possibility in uh, the great plan uh, that's in the middle of uh, Hungary where I start where I try to do my, my my service what I what I can do there are several people who usually don't have any experience how a Jew looks like maybe uh, a Jew have uh, has has horn or a or a, or a tail or a, or he has a big big, uh, big big nose yeah sure so uh, first of all we, we we have several work what we have to do in the field it it, it means the small villages and uh, also there are pictures from uh, the, the different channels it means um, television radio uh, new newspapers uh, and the people have different ideas so um, the most strongest message what we can do uh, that we sit together also in uh, the central part of Hungary uh, there are some bigger and smaller cities and there are uh, TV channels so we have the possibility each week or each second week or, or in a month uh, the, the believers uh, sit together and uh, speak each other uh, brothers and it could be a strong or a stronger message. Always when I have uh, a question like this, uh, I have, I always have a story, which, 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 uh, which can show uh, the problem deeply. The story said that from San Francisco to Washington, uh, on the flight, traveling together, uh, coordinately, next uh, seat, they uh, next each other, and um, Lee feels that uh, Con watching so strong, so straight, and it, it, uh, after a few minutes, it is really uncomfortable. Um, ask, is there any problem? Can I help you, Con? I don't like you. You don't like me? Well, why? Because uh, you destroyed Pearl Harbor. What a nonsense. It was the Japanese army. I'm from China. <laughs> cool. All the same. All the same. Mm. So kind. Okay. After a few minutes, Kohn feels that Lee watching so straight, straight, and feels Kohn really uncomfortable <laughs> himself. So, uh, can I help you? Is there any problem? I don't like Jews. You don't like Jews? I'm Jew. Why? Because you, you, you sang the Titanic. Are you normal? What, what are you saying? It was an iceberg. An ice mountain. Iceberg. I understand? Iceberg, Rosenberg, all the same. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, storytelling is stories sharing and uh, what is behind these stories that's the interesting thing. Father Kish. Uh, to answer your question I don't think there's a special kind of secularization in Hungary. Uh, it's part of the European uh, 
uh, general cultural movement is not more, not less. Um, and I think even um, generally spoken, actual problem of Europe is not anymore secularization. It used to be some decades before, but uh, relativism, yes. And when you spoke uh, that it's very important to work together and, uh, and sh go together to the school, you, you may confound people. I think that it's very important that the best way to do it, that everybody presents himself and he is uh, trustworthy. Uh, you can trust him, especially young people, children, kids at the school. They ask questions. What? I'm very grateful when they ask questions because I have the courage to ask big things which other believe, think but no, don't pronounce. Uh, and I think uh, one of the big da uh, dangerous uh, uh, development is relativism because I mean uh, it's, it's, it's not going in direction of peace if you say it doesn't matter whether you are Jewish or Catholic or, or Sikh or whatever, it doesn't matter. And, and I ask, follow his example, I tell you now a story. It's always still green and uh, corn. Um, corn opens a vegetable sh shop and, um, um, and he cheats. And uh, green goes to the, uh, always corn for the two, by the way, goes to the rabbi and say, look, uh, corn, this is uh, really, uh, a thief and, and, and he cheats and says, you are right, my son. And half an hour later comes a uh, call and says, you know, green, it's, uh, it's the last person you tolerate, he is, is a thief. You are right, my person, my, my son. And then the son of the rabbi said that my papa Laban, you told both of them, you are right. You can't be right. You are right, my son. <laughs> Okay, uh, now coming back to a concrete situation. Uh, that's our situation. Yeah, that's uh, you are right. You too. You too. <laughs> now the floor is uh, more vibrant. Yes, Bishop. And then uh, uh, secularization. I'm I'm fully agree with with Father Kish. It is a European uh, cultural phenomenon and uh, in some uh, some sense there is a there is a Hungarian specialty and in the last years uh, in the Hungarian common speech not just in the church but outside the church uh, I heard again and again Hungary is dedicated to uh, defend the European Christian. And I mean, this is a, a very special situation. Uh, if the new elected old prime minister said uh, that uh, there are two very important uh, issues for him. One is the <coughs> regulation of the migrant problems and the second one is the defend the uh, Hungarian Christian values for Europe. I mean this is a, a very uh, difficult question. What, what does it mean today? Uh, then I, I met in Germany several years ago uh, a Lutheran bishop from uh, Africa. And uh, he told me, you know, I visited this uh, German church since several decades and so on and so on. And I realized in the German uh, churches they are, uh, they lose their membership and so on and so on. And we at home in Africa, our churches were, were uh, full with living congregation and so on and so on. And I, I said, it will be never happened in our country. And 
know, I realize that secularization is a phenomenon even in all countries. So I mean, this is not a statistic uh, mm -hmm. uh, phenomenon that we are not secularized, you are secularized, and so on and so on. This is not a, not a good uh, 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 approach, yes. Uh, we, and we are sitting in the same boat in this sense. Yeah. Really, we are sitting in the same boat. Yeah. Uh, There's a symbol of our conference, this boat. Uh, I'm very happy that you raised the question uh, of defending Christianity uh, in this country. For me as a guest of Hungary, I was a little bit absent to raise this question, but now it is on the floor. Could you answer how do you feel uh, when you are listening, we have to defend Christianity or Christian faith? Uh, I would like to respond to the question of secularism because in the statistics, in the census data, we, we saw uh, from every uh, decade that uh, uh, a considerable part of the population is not following any religion or the religious affiliation is not known. So from the data, we would say that there is secularism. But I would say the question is that maybe our answers to the needs of the people of different communities are not adequate. Maybe we cannot address the people, we cannot address their needs, we cannot give them the right answer to their questions, what they would like to hear. And maybe that's one problem. But concerning the cooperation, and now there is a very big gap between the, the religious people and the, the so-called secular people. But I think uh, with cooperation, we need to bridge this gap. Uh, because, at least from the point of view of Islam, if we take the human origin, so we are all sons of Adam, and Adam was created from dust. So no human beings can be excluded from this cooperation. So we have to stretch out uh, uh, for, for the, the so-called secular people on the basis of the common origin of humankind. I would like to continue with the secularization issue. Secularization is not new. It's uh, hundreds of years uh, old uh, process. But it, has, uh, it is now uh, arriving at very, very appalling uh, consequences. I mean, uh, the consumer society is a product of secularization, no doubt. Because uh, uh, this is actually ignoring the fact that everything belongs to God. And uh, we have to be... Uh, we have to be, uh, uh, I mean, observe this ownership and only only take as much as is this time for us. Now, I think the importance of uh, interfaith dialogue is important from this point of view because we it helps us uh, reinforcing our faith that every every living being, every other human being, is a brother or sister, <coughs> and whatever whatever his or her religion and that we have to work together and help each other to reverse this uh, process of, uh, of actually pilfering God's, God's, uh, God's uh, goods and God's uh, property. So for me, this, is, this gives a very great uh, enthusiasm in actually not proselytizing, but to give information to people about God. And, I'm, and I'm, I'm very happy when others do the same in another religion, because I'm absolutely convinced that this uh, world as we know it, and as we live it, can only be rescued from complete collapse if religions, in their own ways, uh, it, explain people that they are responsible for their consumption, responsible for, for what they do, what they pilfer, and, and, and how, how they preserve God's ownership. Before I open the floor, my last question to the panel is, uh, uh, what do you expect in the future for the interface uh, 
interreligious dialogue in Hungary? What are you wishing? What are you expecting? <coughs> now, Father <laughs> Kish. Um, we have the tendency in this country to, to, to don't look over the border. Um, we are in a global world, whether we like or not. And the religion working together might help us to have a better look. For instance, if I am in Thailand or whatever, I always contact friends in this country, which I know for instance or elsewhere, to help me to understand the country. I don't go just the places with the internet, hotels and all this, but in the countryside. And the countryside you find the real people. And I think uh, we, we have we are a network, a networking we can have. And today with the internet, young people can and do reach uh, Australia, Canada and so forth. Let learn from them and let teach them and mutually um, to, to give them a, a, a larger side of the world than just the narrow one. Because the, the, the secular, so-called secular view is narrow too. By the way, I have a positive intention uh, and categorization of uh, uh, secularization. For instance, in the European Constitution, you find subsidiarity. Where does it come from? The Catholic Church. So one way to influence people is not just to be in our churches and preach, but also to give them over and let them, let them accept it, let them use it. We don't need the copyright good things. Just offer them as much as we can. Thank you. Rabbi Thomas. Thank you. Um, five years ago, we started a new program. Uh, I hope it became a milestone uh, to make uh, something for uh, the young generation. It means the Christian and Jewish Council. Uh, we wrote a book about uh, the Hungarian Jewish history, but we wrote together. So, uh, Christian and Jews, the last uh, 2,000 years. And uh, inside the views, what we can Im Im implant it, uh, in the book, we started something new without a copyright, because belief. Uh, that our work and our our way, what we have to hold each other hands strong. So, in that case, about the education, uh, maybe books, what we can do to, together and give to the youngsters to learn it and for the teachers also have opened New, new doors. I think uh, it is one of the fragments. Thank you. Uh, one uh, very, very concrete expectation, and uh, uh, it is a, a old dream for me, mm -hmm. but uh, it is a, uh, just a dream. We have the possibility to. Uh, religious education and so on and so on. And we produce every church, every confession, uh, their own uh, catechism uh, books and so on and so on. Uh, and of course, we, we teach the Protestant children about Roman Catholic Church, about the Jewish community, about uh, the Muslim community and so on and so on. Uh, for me, it, it would be a very, very great step forward if we write something about the others, we will ask them, um, uh, am I right if I say the Roman Catholic Church teach think Jewish and so on and so on. It would be a very, very great step then, you know, uh, I know this is a very hot topic, uh, the whole migrant issue, but, uh, but I must say, education. Uh, 
some decades ago in Hungary, if uh, a, a kid say said the other, you are a gypsy, it was a shame, blame. Today, uh, among the young generation, when uh, they they will uh, say something uh, in the language of the hate speech, they say. You are a migrant. Migrant. You know? And uh, it is a very, very uh, bad situation. And if we don't realize each other and we, we, don't, we don't ask each other, uh, um, am I right if I say Best, best. So it, it would be for me a very complete step. Thank you very much. Time is running for both partners, and then the floor will be opened. Yeah. Uh, just a very quick one. Uh, <clears throat> uh, some years back, we have been contacted by the Police Academy. The Police Academy has realized, probably as a result of uh, many years of interface uh, dialogue, that they need to educate the young police officers in various faiths. So they contacted us to, to give us short descriptions, of course, aimed at uh, what a police officer should know about, for, for instance, in case of an arrest of or this or that or, or that uh, denomination member. <coughs> what are the specifics of, uh, in our case, of practitioners? If, if someone, is, uh, someone is arrested, what food can can be given, what uh, basic rights should be respected. I think this is a very nice and important byproduct of uh, interfaith dialogue. Uh, unfortunately, it was not in the compulsory curricula. It was in the optional, <laughs> but it was a very good product. But let me respond, respond quickly to the defense of Christianity, because it was a very important question. Uh, first, we, we heard this slogan, we were very happy that the, the, the values that we have a lot of common will come back to the focus again. But since two th years, uh, when these anti-Muslim slogans uh, uh, started, and uh, it, it was the peak in, during the elections, so we, we became very skeptical, because uh, the Islamic or the Muslim presence were eliminated three times completely during uh, the course of history. So the question is, of what price the difference, uh, defense of Christianity uh, should be paid. So is it against others? Is it extermination? Is it cutting the rights? So these are the questions from the, the community. These are very important questions. And um, another advocate, so to spare time maybe later. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, your uh, plenary uh, has been very attentive and uh, silent now. Uh, you could add your remarks, your question to the panel. For example, the question of religious education in public schools and so on, but I do not want to uh, regulate uh, the uh, discussion. The floor is open. We have one assistant. I've been uh, told to, uh, ra to, to bring uh, to hand over the mic. Is that correct? Yeah. I've been told, yeah. yeah. Where, where's the mic? Uh, we, we have to use this microphone. Well, I will move and bring it to you and uh, I stay. Thank you very much. Uh, good. You're not what you Salam alaikum, may peace and blessing be upon us all. Uh, let me introduce myself first. My name is Dinda. I am Indonesian student studying here in the Corvinus University of Budapest in the double degree program with the University of Glasgow on Russian Central Eastern European studies. Um, so I have comments and questions. So first of all, I want to, um, uh, how to say it, appreciate, well, I'm grateful to be here. This is my first time living in Budapest. This is my first time attend such event like this. And uh, uh, I have to share that on my personal view, I am very fascinated by the situation in Hungary, actually. Uh, the fact that um, 
apparently you have all, you know, the, the only multi-faith network. You have Muslims, Jewish, Christians, Krishna, Hindus, Buddhism. And for me, uh, coming from uh, a very diverse nation, it's actually a treasure for, for your society. I see as an as an you can say I'm foreigner. I am foreigner. Uh, I can say that Hungary actually, well, based on the facts, have a very significant potential to contribute uh, to mutual understanding and respect not only uh, not only in the European region but to the world. But um, the politic is um, like a hurdle of that potential. Uh, so I have a questions. But before I convey the questions, I have to to um, connect my personal experience first. So last Friday, I was walking on San Galate uh, on the way home from, from the masjid, from the bus, Budapest Mosque. And the very first time in my life, uh, there's some people shout at me. It's a bit contradictory of, of my appreciation first, but there's a um, Hungarian people shout at me, the head wedge, Saudi Arabia, terrorists. Go back to Saudi Arabia, terrorists. And don't worry, I'm fine. <laughs> I'm fine. I'm, 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 I'm open-minded. So I was just like uh, ignoring. But um, my question is, um, other than that, um, it's, it's fine. I mean, my experience, that experience is really light. It's nothing. But the other person, the other Muslim persons, have experienced far more worse. So my question is, there's a really um, real connection between the political rhetoric, the media, and the reality on the ground. And so do you think Hungary is actually in urgent need of mutual understanding and respect? Do you think that Hungary is in emergency to, to do something to cope with that? If you agree, how, um, okay, let me, how actually have you done to spread this really peaceful atmosphere not only for the people who have special interest, but but people who are you know and public, so that the reality on the ground is the same as the reality here in this ground in this particular particular forum. I hope uh, my question is clear enough. Thank you very much. I would rather not comment on the uh, part of the question relationship between politics and the uh, interfaith dialogue because I don't think this is my, my, my remit. But I would like to mention that that, that sort of broad outreach that that internet page represents, which also discusses questions of migrants, questions of movement of people in general, uh, is a very, very good antidote in case of those who care to read it. But uh, of course, it is our job to, to spread it wider and wider. But there, is, there will always remain a, a part of the population that will not read it. So uh, what can you do? Yes, what uh, Sister Linda mentioned, it happens on a daily basis. That there are insults and even attacks. But to, to uh, tell you the situation, the, the legal environment in Hungary is very good, very safe, no problem. The problem is sometimes the rhetorics of some politicians, that's the problem, and it gives some tone to the media. But what is annoying the most, so those people who are attacked or insulted, they don't even go to the police because they lost the trust in the system because they, they feel that the system is against them. So they, they don't even report to the police. Uh, some people are beaten, they are not, not going to the police. So that's a very big problem. But what we can do, because the, the, the mosques are full of people, full of non-Muslims who are coming to our problems <coughs> and interested in Islam. They would like to hear about Islam from the Muslims and um, 
we are working on this field. And that we, we hope that after a while, we will reach a critical mass and the general uh, public, the opinion of general public will change. But it will take lots of time. It's not an easy, not a fast uh, a process. And also we have conferences like this. We have events of, 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 of multi-faith dialogue and the message will go on. But it will take time. So we shouldn't uh, lost hope. We have to make the effort. And I think the, the peaceful people are still outnumber the violent ones. So we have to go on. Thank you. I, I would like to, to, to let the plenary uh, contribute. Perhaps at the end, you have the chance in short history, a short story or a short remark to answer on that. But now I think uh, the floor is, uh, should be open. Ladies, uh, ladies first, yeah. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm Clara Anwar from uh, Hungary. Uh, I did my uh, PhD in economics, but I have a degree in uh, Islamic Sharia studies as well. I work, uh, in my free time, I'm working for the uh, organization for Muslims in Hungary. Uh, actually, uh, I would like to reflect uh, to your last question. Uh, what do we think about in, uh, what do we how we see the future of the interreligious dialogue uh, actually uh, my view is very optimistic I think we can save the world we can do something together uh, if we cooperate together to to a common uh, values and uh, we catch each other hands and we go ahead we can change the world to have a peaceful world. And this is my, my, my view of, of the future. And I hope most of you have the same view. <laughs> Thank you very much. Are there other, other remarks? The next one, please. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, my name is Mahdos. I'm from Iran. I'm a student in Budapest. Um, I wanted to um, add something. I've been living here since five years ago. and. Uh, I'm in a very good connection with Hare Krishna community here as a Muslim. And um, I would say, um, why are not so many young people here? <laughs> um, maybe you would, you're thinking about it as well. Because uh, unfortunately, talking about religion is not really uh, fashionable these days, or uh, it's not really accepted by youth. So, uh, maybe the reason is uh, that lo lots of uh, religious leaders are just saying nice words, but not practice those nice words in their daily lives. How many of um, these honored people of this panel or other people in this room would have uh, close friends of other religions in their life, in their um, personal life? Or they have, um, uh, do they let their children marry people of other religion? Uh, do they um, do they um, do they accept uh, other people as guests in their homes, or do they invite other people? Do they accept food from um, other religion people? Uh, of course, they are not going to violate uh, their religious uh, rules. Of course, um, they will if they are Muslims, they will accept only halal food. I know that, but other than that, are they going to be open personally? Because if we have a message to spread. For the youth, we have to say something practic practical. We have to practice it by our heart, and if we do it by our heart, um, people would listen, and they would also uh, add to this. Whenever I go to a synagogue or to a Hare Krishna temple, even in India to a Hindu temple, I've never been um, reacted badly because of my hijab. They were so um, uh, tolerable, they accept it because I know what I'm doing. I'm not violating anybody else, so they're not going to tolerate, um, uh, violate my um, personal life. Yes, there must be, um, yeah, I'm so op optimistic to it maybe, that, um, in the outside world there are people who will use hate speech, who will um, not practice this, but um, I think um, if um, even, let, let me put it in, in a uh, fashionable thing. 
Even today, when I'm going to shop something from Amazon, I'm not just searching for this, but I'm going to search how other people uh, talk about that uh, uh, special product. So maybe the process is changed, but the core is um, the same. We're uh, we need human contact. We have. I have to se see someone uh, with like a Muslim who would be a very close friend with a Jew and have uh, friends of other religion. And if I see this in my every li everyday life, I will also accept it and follow it. So I would uh, say, uh, besides these nice words that we all said in this nice boat, I hope we will um, practice all this good sense in our personal life. Thank you. Thank you very much for this testimony. A last contribution in the background, uh, Bishop. Uh, thank you very much. I'm Bishop William Kenny, Roman Catholic Oxford, Bishop of Burnley, of the United Kingdom. We have a peculiar situation in England and Wales where the Catholic population is about 7%, but we educate about 11% of the children of England and Wales in Catholic schools. That means there is a gap, quite a big one, of the number of Catholics in schools and those who are not. I'm on public record as saying that... Um, I prefer that that gap is filled, there's all sorts of rules, we won't go into those, but I prefer that that gap is filled by people of faith rather than by uh, Christians of non-faith. Because my brothers and sisters from other religions, however much I may disagree with their doctrine, and I do, you don't need to be any doubts about that, but they bring with them that gift of faith. And that is a, a big contribution. So that is the first thing that I would say. And I think what we desperately need in interreligious dialogue is a recognition of the things we already have. Not the discussions, which we should have, of course, about the things we differ on, but we do have things in common. Faith is one of them. Secondly, I always get nervous of any country, not particularly Hungary, but any country, which says we have to keep out people in order to maintain our stroke culture, stroke religion, whatever it is. Let me take a country I know reasonably well, Sudan, where it is Christians who are kept out. Uh, and I always feel the basic faith in that country must be very weak if you have to keep people out of it in order to preserve it. So that would be my uh, second point on that. The third with is immigrants, refugees, whatever bring with them very important things. The Muslims brought back into Europe in the Middle Ages the texts of the Greek philosophers, just to take one example. We possibly couldn't be here today and think the way we do if those texts had not returned to uh, Europe. Uh, there are many, many other examples. But I honestly think that while, as I agree with Father Kish, that the, um, we are somewhat involved in an esoteric uh, thing, doing interreligious dialogue, there are very few people uh, doing it, but I honestly think that it is so important and that the future does lie there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now our time will come to the end, and participants of our panel have the chance to make a short conclusion. Short. Short. Who are not believed in, the mir in, in miracles can be rationalist. That's a sentence from David Ben-Gurion, uh, who was the first prime minister of uh, Israel. Um, we have dreams. The dreams, like like a house, the house built up by stones. It's like now, what we do, I believe that's a milestone. Uh, before 15 years or 20 years, I um, had a scholarship with the College of York, and I traveled to Indonesia, the island of Shukovo. And, uh, I have uh, the, the great possibility uh, to research, search about uh, the Silk Road. It means 
uh, the period of King Solomon and uh, Queen Shaba. Um, and you have such a great tradition. At first, I thought and I think that if we have knowledge to each other, to learn and to teach each other, that's the chain. And for each time, we have to remember that uh, we need to work on it. And uh, a short story. Uh, this, the, the story that the chief rabbi of uh, Jerusalem traveled to the Pope. And uh, they have a fancy meeting. And after the, the meeting, uh, uh, the rabbi asked uh, the Pope, what is this really beautiful phone uh, made by gold and silver? And uh, oh, this is a phone to the Almighty. Yes, and may, 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 I, may I use it? Sure, but it's really expensive, so use it short. The rabbi used it after uh, he's really very, very uh, joyful. So put down the phone and, OK, please tell me how much I have to pay. We can do it no matter it was great that you've been in, in, in my office. OK, after a year, uh, the pope uh, uh, going back to Jerusalem and meet uh, in the chief rabbi office in Jerusalem. And after a great meeting, uh, the pope the Pope uh, uh, saw so, uh, a simple black form. What is that? Um, that's a form to the Almighty. And may I use? Sure, please. And after the Pope uh, speaking with the Almighty about hour and hour and a half, after put down, smiling deeply with uh, his heart, and asked, OK, please tell me the price, because it was such a great experience. No problem, it was a local call. <laughs> uh, sure. Uh, there was a question from a young lady. What uh, are doing these honorable uh, people in practice? Uh, I live in Debrecen, this is the second largest city in the eastern part, and it was uh, uh, two years ago a uh, uh, camp for, uh, for uh, my. And uh, it was a very, very uh, bad situation. And I, I said, OK, we invite the people from the camp, the terrorists, and so on, and so on, to take part in our uh, worship service in the congregation where I am. And it was amazing. Uh, when, when our traditional reformed congregation member realized they are real people, they shake hand and so on and so on. Second, I uh, teach at the Theological University in Debrecen. We organized that, uh, a, a, a group from students uh, goes regularly to the camp, the refugee camp, to play with the children and so on and so on. It was everything organized, but uh, uh, I'm sorry to say the camp was closed to the decision by the local government. So practical steps in the local government, local publications. Thank you very much. Uh, the only word which I'm using uh, frequently is short. <laughs> But time is running. Sorry. It's going to be very short. So uh, I would like to say, maybe as a, some sort of conclusion, that uh, God is responsible for the world. So and responsible for the outcomes of the efforts. So not we are responsible for the outcomes. We are responsible to choose the right way and work on the right way. So we have to work. We have to go on and don't care about the results because God will decide yes. the result. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna, just a brief thing. My experience is that the more I, I participate in interfaith events, the stronger my own faith is. And that's not because uh, I think the other faiths are not coming from God. So this is a paradox. 
and that we should we should really work on our own face, and then we will be better in our interface dialogue. Thank you. And I just want to turn your face. Uh, you need to have a self-esteem and a self-knowledge to have a real knowledge and esteem for the other. And dialogue means dia and logos. Dia it means two, and we are equal. And logos means there should be the logos behind, otherwise there is no logos at all. Well, thank you very much for this uh, discussion, for your active uh, attention as plenum, for the contribution of the participants. Uh, I just want at the end to uh, 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 set a focus on a German campaign. It's named, uh, Do You Know Who I Am? And the background supported by the German government is to invite people from other religions come home before we come home in, in my own home to, to share experiences. Because, as one of the ladies said, we do not know each other. And this campaign, Do You Know Who I Am, is very successful because we are not talking about people, but we are talking with people. And that was the aim of this discussion. Thank you very much. And now I give the floor to uh, Mark to make the conclusion and for some announcement, I think. And we can be, be seated here. A very short concluding summary. Uh, um, I just want to say, obviously, a huge thank you to all the guests. I mean, my, my day job is at the university teaching uh, peace building studies, peace, peace and conflict studies. And one of the most important things we emphasize is that uh, we cannot generalize about building peace. You know, one of the most important things is understanding the complex social, economic, political dynamics within a context before we can hope to start peace building uh, and this for me has, has been hugely helpful in understanding the, the, the important initiatives between different faith communities but also the wider broader political situation within Hungary. However as ECRL one of the things we do generalize on is that we strongly believe that religions and faiths working together can, can only help uh, enhance our capacity for peace building. <coughs> Uh, religions, we believe, are stronger working together. Um, the next steps this part's entitled, I, I haven't got hu anything hugely Im uh, uh, important to say, apart from to extend our support to interreligious and also multi-religious cooperation here in Hungary. As a pan-European council, uh, we tend to try and operate at, at, at a broader European level, but we also try and strongly encourage and support uh, international initiatives for building interreligious councils. Not in any hierarchical way, we're not trying to uh, extend our own domain of influence, but um, as part of the, the international network of religions for peace, we can support building uh, international religious councils and then they are directly affiliated to Religions for Peace internationally in New York. So if we can help in that process in any way, uh, please, we, we uh, are very keen to stay in touch and support interfaith dialogue, but perhaps more importantly for us, multi-faith collaboration and action. And as part of that action, we're about to go off now and, and that's why we've got to cut the symposium short, unfortunately to support the very important Food for Life program that ISKCON's running here in, in Hungary and, and Budapest. And I'm sure any of you would be welcome to come and join us if you wanted to come along. So just to end, <coughs> one important point, the very important photograph. Once we finished here, could I ask you all to go straight outside up the ramp and we're gonna have a, a, a symposium photograph immediately after this. But before that, I'm sure you'd like to join me in thanking all our speakers, our distinguished, honoured guests here today, um, our keynote speakers here for uh, their time and the important knowledge and information they've given us. 